Here in the US, there is a lot of talk about people going missing, getting robbed, raped or murdered, i.e. the world is not a safe place outside the United States. Have you guys ever felt this in a foreign country? For the last 14 years or so, we've been living and traveling in some pretty remote places. Now we like to see this as exciting and challenging, but occasionally it does put us outside our comfort zone. In next week's episode, we're going to be tackling how we sail through some pretty bad weather. But in this week's episode, we're going to talk about what it's like when you step off the boat into a completely foreign culture. Funny little head in the background <laughs> behind me. We've just landed the dinghy. Quite an interesting experience. It's a usual thing where you throw the anchor out the back of the dinghy, make it tight, pull it in a bit so you can step off the dinghy and then release the painter so it drops back out into the water. Um, what is there to add, Liz? Um, I tied the painter to a rock. That's right. Mm. With okay. the help of a local lady selling coconuts. So now we're going to explore Sika Cap. Well, here we are down by the water's edge and you can see how close we are anchored to the town. We're right there. And on the shore here are all the fishing boats that are coming and going. I'm guessing they're refueling, restocking. You can see lots of pipes running, taking in more water. A few people hanging out in the shade. <laughs> Up a kebab. All right. Right, he's got some good fruit and vegetables. The dried fish is quite useful. Yeah, Walk in, then come back. Oh, yeah. Where are you from? Uh, England. Mm. You're from Indonesia. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I said yesterday that for every church there's a mosque, and for every mosque there's a church. And this is one of the bigger ones set up a slight incline. So I got Liz complaining about getting too hot and sweaty. It is, of course, midday. Not the best time for cinematography, unfortunately, but um, hey, we're mad dogs, aren't we? So we think we'll just come and have a quick look at this. Well, doors are locked. I thought God's house was always an uh, open door, but obviously not. Can't really see inside, it's very dark in there. It's a uh, Christian dog. So we're just sitting down having a coffee. Kopi Tampagula. It's about the only Indonesian I can remember from our time in the Anambas. 
and uh, whilst Lizzie's trying to get connection which is a completely futile task we have the usual collection of schoolboys hanging around outside one's a bit camera shy and uh, we've just made friends with these guys he's a Christian and that man on the wall there is his friend who's a politician and apparently he's a good man down the back here we have this is quite a common sight actually we've already passed a number of tailors but at the back of the cafe is the proprietor's wife and she's knocking up a rather pretty little dress said it was busy I just thought I'd grab this moment whilst it's uh, quiet lots of scooters buzzing past and occasionally big trucks trying to get through this uh, single street negotiating the market traders and also all the scooters parked either side uh, of course friendly people very friendly people uh, the standard thing they shout is hello mister it's always hello mister even to Liz it's hello mister uh, they're not um, you know they're not pushy they're just uh, friendly slightly inquisitive but um, they're not really in your face at all just walking past the man selling dried penises Uh, we found another street which runs parallel to that main street which as you heard was very busy this is more residential here there's some beautiful buildings kids playing up uh, side streets and an old lady here enjoying her, her lunch <laughs> When we came in, you pointed at the island and I said, oh, they remind me of the clove trees that we saw in Anambas two years ago. And look, here are cloves drying. So I reckon they've got a clove business here, which is pretty good. Right, we're at the local hospital and Liz has been suffering for weeks from conjunctivitis and we've been told there could be someone here who could help her out. You're a bit young for reception, aren't you? Just been for a little cruise in the dinghy and quite interesting, just going back up along the riverfront where we came in and where Liz and I walked this morning. But it's very interesting to see a different perspective because of course a lot of the activity, most of the activity in town is based on fishing and things relating to the water. So you've got a lot of stilted jetties, not just industry but houses, restaurants, 
they look like bars, I don't think they are. And just cruising up there in the dinghy, it's just interesting just to pause and have a look in. And there seems to be a lot of people just hanging out in these restaurants. A lot of people preparing their boats ready for the evening. There's kids swimming in the water. The depot where we went to to get our diesel, that's busy with boats coming and going. So just, um, it's got a real buzz to it. And Liz and I were saying this earlier about the town itself, is that it's very lively. Of course, this is relatively speaking, of course. I think after two, near two months of being in the Mentaris and it being very peaceful and almost no one around, this is a bit of a shock to the system to have all of this vitality around, but it's, uh, it's infectious and it's very interesting. And when you were shooting with the drone, uh, it was great, but they all kept looking up. <laughs> yeah, so the idea was I wanted to try and capture some of this activity that was going on to get a sense of what a Saturday afternoon in Sikapet is like. Sikakap, sorry. But, of course, as soon as you hover the drone above them, they're like, Ooh, what, what's that? Of course, the great thing is that the kids love it. So, ended up with four or five kids around me. Always great fun showing them what the drone can see. Of course, they've never seen this perspective before, and, and neither have I. So, uh, yeah, that was good fun. Could you just shed a little light, shed a little light? Put the lime in the coconut, drink and pull up. You put the lime in the coconut, drink and put the kid up. Put the lime in the coconut. We got coconuts. <laughs> five five thousand rupee per coconut, which is about twenty five pence. We got four. That's a pound. Um, they've all been peeled, all ready to drink. Coconuts. And in return, he got. We gave him a t-shirt and we gave him a pack of cigarettes. Is it People, a fair deal, do you think? I think it's a very fair deal. People may think we shouldn't be giving cigarettes away, getting up on their high horses, but people love the cigarettes here and they're expensive for them, but they're cheap for us, so we have a few on board to give away. And we get coconuts. So how dangerous is it to sail in some of the most remote parts of the world? Robert gave us that opening question and Danny on Patreon wondered if we ever fear for our safety. Also, we had a question from Seamus on our YouTube community and he asked, how do you know who to trust? PN Westy, hello Sean. He takes it one stage further. As an ugly American, and that's his words, not ours, he is overcompensating by not wanting to intrude. Interesting. This generally is a subject that we get asked about more probably than anything else. I think so, yeah. And actually Grady over on Patreon, one of our supporters, I, I think kind of sums it up for us, who says common sense and treating others the way you want to be treated dissolves those comfort zone issues. And I think that's the key factor to our approach and that's respect. Yes. So when we go into a country, when we visit a new town, we, we like to stay reserved. Uh, we don't draw too much attention to ourselves. We're certainly not being raucous and drunk and really just treating people with the level of respect, the same level of respect that we would expect to get in turn. And that pretty much works 99.9% .9 of the time. Yes. Pete and Werner on Patreon say, smiling goes a long way. And we would agree with that. So lots of smiles, people will accept you and they'll smile back and that just breaks the ice. The other thing to think about is the way you dress. Sometimes you really shouldn't be going ashore in just a bikini and flip-flops. It's better to cover up, certainly in some of the Muslim countries and certainly in populated areas. Even when you're clearing in, think about for men wearing a shirt. And recently you were rejected because you were wearing shorts. He was told to go away and put some long trousers on. That was in Indonesia. Yes, yeah, so I think by abiding by these basic rules, 
just makes you become more accepted by the local people and will therefore help minimise that uh, sense of being outside your comfort zone. So we say goodbye to Sikakap and I have to say that was a really enjoyable little visit that only thing that marred it was the amount of crap in the water despite me saying the other day to camera that uh, these people keep their beaches clean the amount of shit in the water is quite shocking actually I think it's partly because um, there's a lot of eddies in and around this channel between these two islands and I guess it uh, picks up a lot of the crap but uh, anyway and there's that passenger ferry over there coming in once more and we're going to head down to the second half of these two islands so there you go you can see the target there as we zoom out there's the top half and we're now going to head down to the bottom to an anchorage round about here and that's going to be our last anchorage before our next big run to Engano which is down there not a great day, unfortunately. We appear to be surrounded by a lot of rain clouds. Look at that one. That's pretty hardcore, isn't it? And uh, these continue, we're looking east, by the way. These continue all the way down the eastern side. Um, now, in theory, the weather we've been getting has been coming from the northwest and heading southeast. Now, this school really can't decide what it's doing. Or rather, I can't decide what it's doing, but we seem to be getting some residual wind off of the back of it, or the front of it. So I've just put out the uh, stay sail and the mizzen again, which has given us a little bit more speed, which is always nice. The, uh, the first one I showed you previously was actually over there, and I think it's um, dispersed with the sun. It sort of dried it up, but um, this one's still quite heavy. I think also they're possibly moving due south, which is why they appear to be getting a little bit closer to us. Uh, well anyway, keeps us on our toes, doesn't it? Well, 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 look at this. The engine is off and Genoa's out for the Yankee. Uh, I think this is possibly a bit of residual wind that's come off that squall that was coming over. It has now fortunately burnt itself out, so or rained itself out. There's a few white crests on the wave indicating that's what force coming up to force four. So uh, we've got a good 10 knots of wind now. As you can see, we haven't put the main out. Don't actually remember the last time we put the main out. We've just got so used to flying with the uh, the new code zero, and and also we've got time to get down to the other end. So I figured I'd leave leave the main away. Just got the mizzen. And this out and we're actually sailing. I've forgotten what it's like. Well that's right, that was just a bit of uh, wind left over from that squall that's disappeared. Wind dropped from 10 to 12 knots down to 8 knots so I thought we'd get the code zero out and it's dropped down to what is it five knots now I think so we're barely doing two and a half knots now anyway we'll we'll just keep this open for a little bit let it dry out it's a bit damp from the rain from last night and I haven't seen him in a few days So um, speed dropped right down there, so we put the sail away, continue to motor, and now we have this to contend with. Fortunately, I don't think there's any avoiding this one. Well, we've decided to go for it. The rain has lightened up a little. It seems as if there's more coming in up the north there, so we just figured Sod it. Let's just go Let's see what happens. We can actually see definition in the clouds and on the horizon there, which is something I suppose. Well, we've chosen a spot, not on any anchorage guide or cruising guide or anything at all, but we just thought it looked quite good. I've named it Butterfly Bay. 
if you look at the aerial view of this island it looks a little bit like a uh, pee, pee actually uh, it looks sort of butterfly shaped we've kind of pushed our way into a gap you can see the reef there it's quite close it's only a hundred meters or so and that runs into there and then to the west is another reef so we're sort of protected ish now if Big North Westerly comes through, we'll still get the brunt of the wind, but hopefully the waves will be broken up. Tried to push our way in um, a little bit close there. Got quite nervous when it dropped away from 14 meters to eight meters quite very quickly actually. So um, backed out and just came um, back a little bit further out. But uh, anyway, we'll see how it is. This is pretty remote here. Okay, so we've been doing a bit of housework today and we managed to get a weather forecast for the next few days. And as you know, we have pretty much had no wind for most of this journey, but for the last couple of days, we've been seeing some really miserable weather coming through. And having looked at the forecast, it looks like it is the beginning of something quite major coming through. So we were planning to leave tomorrow on a two day journey to Engano. There's a big front coming down from the northwest and uh, we have been advised to watch out for these northwesterlies because they can be quite vicious. And sure enough, in two days time or one and a half days time as we would be hitting in Garno or just before, the winds are hitting well over 30 odd knots. From my experience, you can add another 10 knots onto that. So the question is, um, do we make the most of these winds since we haven't done any sailing and it would be nice to catch them? Um, or do we play it safe? I suspect that it could be quite hard work out there with those kind of winds. So what we're thinking is maybe sit it out for a day and then catch the tail end of it to get at least a good day sail towards Engano. There are some practical things you can do before you arrive in a new unexplored area. Danny on Patreon and Deprez on YouTube ask us if we do any kind of investigations and research before we get there to find out about customs. And yes, we do. And it really does help to put you a little bit more at ease. For instance, um, in Thailand, they really don't like feet. They don't want to see them on the table, on the chair, and you certainly shouldn't be pointing the directions with your feet. Other things we've discovered over the years is that in some places they really don't want you to touch them. It might be a holy man who can't be touched by anyone. We may be in a culture where it's not really polite to touch a member of the opposite sex. So I have got used over the years to just doing this as a greeting. Also to help ease yourself into a culture might be to learn some basic words, yeah. of course. So that's something that we try and do. We're not brilliant at it and have to say some languages are more difficult to learn than others. I'm <laughs> looking at you, Thailand. Uh, but we try our best to just learn some basics, so basic greetings. Opposites are useful. Yes, no, in, out. Provisioning, yes. you know, we learn fruit and vegetables. Numbers as well, yeah. at least count to 10. Yeah. And just having these, these, just these basic words just helps ease you into those cultures. Yeah, it helps you. It gives you a little bit more confidence, doesn't it? And they really, really like it and will respond mm. very well to it. The other thing that people will always be asking you about is where you're from and where you're going, and they don't understand understand the concept in many places of living on a boat. So I always have a picture of Espa on my phone ready to show them and we also learn the local word for boat. Not only that, they will ask you a lot of questions. They'll ask you how old you are, how much is your boat worth, what are you worth, do you have a house and how much did that cost? Okay, in the UK certainly it's the sort of question you never would ask, but over here in Southeast Asia these are perfectly normal and acceptable questions, so don't take offence at them. So if you're struggling to get your head around going to foreign countries, I think the key thing to remember is that you are just a tourist, nothing more. You're just a traveler visiting another country as people have done for thousands of years before you. And I think ultimately just treat the people and the place that you visit with respect. And more often than not, you'll get that level of respect returned to you.
More answers to questions coming up. But remember, if you're a Patreon, you can have one-on-one -on -one conversations with us and we will answer your questions in detail and have a full conversation with you about whatever subject you like. Yes, our patrons and our run funders really do help contribute to our output. Basically, we wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't for them. So to those guys, we thank you. And if you do wish to support us, if you enjoy watching our show, then please do consider becoming a patron or a run funder. As a Patreon, you get early access to our videos. You get permanent and heavy discounts yes. in our shop. And we make sure that we answer any personal questions they may send us, uh, including by email. Yeah, we send them gifts as well and little, little special presents now and then. So thank you. Another major concern that people have which puts them outside their comfort zone when travelling is health. 24-hour travellers on our YouTube community tab ask us if we have insurance. Now, we don't have medical insurance. We're covered on the boat for um, emergencies, so if anything would happen on the boat, that's completely covered off. But general health, no, we're not insured. Main reason for that is in Southeast Asia, the medical uh, costs over here are negligible compared to what we pay, certainly in the West and certainly in the US. And they are also excellent. A lot of people come here specifically for medical holidays. So no, we don't, but we are going to the US, as you all know. And we know that when we travel over there, we are going to have to take out comprehensive medical insurance of some kind. So if anyone's got any suggestions on what we should do before we get to the US regarding, regarding medical health, please put them in the comments below. Yeah, and as you saw in that episode, Liz went into this hospital on this tiny island, this remote island, for this serious conjunctivitis problem that she had. And she was seen to straight away. Yes. And am I right in saying you didn't even pay for the medication? I didn't pay. I wanted to give them money and they wouldn't accept it. And they said, no, no, it's all free. So there you go. That's Southeast Asia. Food. My second favourite subject. Uh, of course, when you're on a boat, traveling to these places, a lot of the brands that you're used to back at home that make you feel comfortable, those comfort foods, aren't necessarily available. And so you kind of have to adjust your diet a bit and get used to what the local people eat and what you can source from the local stores. Yeah, and it's fun. Same Day Blue on YouTube asks what it's like for vegetarians. Well, we are pescatarians. We eat fish, but we don't eat meat. Um, and everywhere we've been, it's easy to get vegetables and fruit because that's what the poor people eat. They eat vegetables, fruit and staples like rice, um, noodles and all that kind of thing. So it's absolutely really easy if you're a vegetarian. Here's a Yoda-like brain twister <laughs> from our very first patron and good friend, American McGee. To be outside your comfort zone, you must first define a comfort zone. As you've been living in a life of adventure for so long, what exactly is your cultural comfort zone? Gosh, it's, that, that's really difficult because we have been doing this for such a long time. But I will define my home, which I suppose is my cultural zone. And for me, home is three things. It's you, Millie and Esper. And it doesn't matter where in the world the three of you are. Could you just shed a 